Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the live stream. Welcome to those watching from other parts of the UK and the world. God bless you all in uh, Jesus' name. We'll start by uh, thanking God for the life of the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip. We'll remember the Queen in our prayer, the royal family, and for the nation during this time of mourning. We thank God for Prince Philip's contribution to the country, his family, and most of all, his support for the Queen. So a few lines from the Bible, Psalm 116. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that we can come into your presence in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we lift up to you, Lord God, the nation as we remember Prince Philip. We thank you for his devotion to his family and to his country. We thank you, Lord, for his royal duties which he performed. We thank you, Lord God, for this man who was a support to the Queen. We thank you, Lord God, for his service to the Navy. We thank you, Lord God, for Prince Philip's commitment, commitment to various causes. We thank you, Lord God, for the impact he had in schools and on the education sector. Father, we thank you for long life that you have given him. And now, Lord God, the psalmist said, Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Father, in this time of mourning, we pray for comfort. We lift up Queen Elizabeth, and you will comfort her and bless her as she grieves. We pray for other members of the royal family as they grieve that they will find comfort in you, O oh God. We pray for the country. We pray for the people who are thinking of the legacy that Prince Philip left behind. And thank you for choosing him and for taking him, O oh God, in your time. We bless you, God. We praise you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you as we remember the life of Prince Philip. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title today is Dealing with Hidden Sins. Dealing with Hidden Sins. The reading is taken from Psalm 19. Psalm 19. And we'll be reading verses 7 to 14. I'll be reading from the ESV, which is the English Standard Version. Psalm 19, beginning at verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous together. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? 
declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be blameless and innocent of the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. A story from school. James was a secondary school student. He lived at home with his mother and three younger siblings. He was a normal lad. He wasn't that popular, but he did have a few friends. When James turned 15, in year 10, something happened that caused his life to change. His mother fell ill and became progressively worse. The burden of care fell upon James. He had to wash her, care for her, feed her, and even take her to the toilet. He also had to cook for his three siblings. He didn't tell anyone what was going on. He missed a lot of school and did not tell the teachers. And then when he did go in, people made negative comments toward him. His friends abandoned him. So he didn't actually want to go into school. He felt low, alone, abandoned. To escape his reality, he started to use illegal drugs. That was how he tried to cope. He kept it hidden and didn't tell anyone. And now he knew it was wrong because his mum had warned him against drugs when he was younger. And he felt guilty as he took them to ease his pain. He did his best to care for his siblings, but he began to neglect himself. School attendance dropped even more, and the drug taking became more regular. Over time, he moved on to harder drugs, and it began to take its toll on his body. One day, on the rare occasion he did attend school, some of the teachers looked at the state of him, and they knew they had to act immediately. They pulled him out of class and spoke to him, and he told them everything, and he was finally able to get help. You see, in James's story, there was a cause to his life and subsequent effects. The fact of his mum falling ill, that's not sin. That's just one of those life situations we find ourselves in. It wasn't planned, but it needed to be dealt with. The fact that James supported and cared for her, that's not sin. That's normal. That's good. But the way he coped with the pressure, the anxiety, the rejection, the pain, led him to deal with his situation in a damaging way, which led to something hidden, something unhealthy, until eventually he got help. I wonder, is there a hidden sin that you're dealing with? Something personal, something ongoing, Perhaps you've been dealing with it for years. Today, we'll look at how to deal with our hidden sins. There is usually a cause and an effect for people hiding something that can explain human behavior. Teachers in schools often think in those terms to explain erratic or changing behavior in students. They'll figure it out, but they're not mind readers. Hidden sins could have been caused by a one-off event, like a sudden fear. Or perhaps a series of repetitive events that has caused someone to have negative thoughts. If you don't cope with the situation well, there may be negative effects as a result. Now, your effects may be different to James's drug-taking. It may be a hidden attitude of the heart. It may be a deep-seated resentment where you truly can't be happy for someone or someone else's success. It may be a specific person. Your heart may have been hardened by what they have done. 
And this has caused you to have these thoughts toward them. And the effects of these causes may have led you into keeping something secret, something you're dealing with that's private. No one knows, but it brings you guilt. If that describes you, don't worry. You're not alone. You're not the only one with hidden sin. King David wrote Psalm 19, and he was a man that knew about guilt and hidden sin. He expressed his thoughts in writing. In verse 7, he talks about God's word. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. God's word converts the soul. It's amazing what God brings to mind as you read the word. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Through reading the word of God, the Bible, God brings to your remembrance through the Holy Spirit certain things that need to be dealt with. That there is hope in God. There is freedom from hidden sins. Jesus Christ brings freedom. He is the living word. There is power in the Christ. There is power in being in him, in partaking of him through faith. It's Jesus Christ that brings change. His power converts the soul. He is the one through the Holy Spirit who revives and brings freedom. There is healing, there is cleansing, there is forgiveness, there is freedom available at the cross of Jesus Christ. Verse 8 says, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And you may feel impure, but God's word comes from a God who is pure and is holy. God's word brings light into darkness. And once our hidden sins are brought into the light of God's word, they can be dealt with. Once these hidden sins are brought to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, they can be dealt with. Verse 9 says, the fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. And as you read the word of God, you may feel distinctly unclean. There is a cause and an effect you may have delved into things the Bible warns against, and the effect could be a stronghold. Verse 11, King David writes, Moreover, by your decrees, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. And sometimes we don't heed God's warning. We've all done that. Your cause may have been the loss of someone, and the effect may have been that you haven't been able to fully let things go. There may have been some unfinished business which has caused you some resentment or perhaps hardness of heart. There is hope for you in Jesus Christ. There is healing at the cross. These things can be dealt with. The cause could have been someone who made you feel awful, worthless, terrible. And the effect could, may have been that you've let yourself go and gotten involved with things that you shouldn't have gotten involved with. The Word of God makes clean. And you can be clean. It washes away impurities. Through the blood of Jesus, He can make you pure. Through faith in Him, you can approach a holy God with an awe and reverential fear, but without a cowering fear. There is healing available at the cross. You can enter into his presence without being afraid. Verse 12. Who can understand his errors? King David knew that he had disobeyed God's word even more than he was aware of. When any hidden sins are brought to light, we can confess them and bring them to the cross. God's Holy Spirit is our helper. He's our comforter who aids us in our battles and times of temptation. Verse 13, King David prayed that these sins may not have dominion over him. I wonder 
Is there any sin that is dominating and controlling you? If there is, there is freedom available in Jesus Christ for you. His very name means Savior, one who saves. The Lord says, therefore, if the Son make you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus Christ can set us free from any hidden sin, any addiction, any pain, any trauma. There is healing at the cross. Come to him who bore all sin, sickness, and pain on the cross and receive the healing that he freely wants to give. Bring it into the light. How does the Son make you free? He says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There is freedom from hidden or secret sin. We abide in his word. We allow the Holy Spirit to minister unto us as he brings the hidden sins to light. The pain that you may experience in your memory or trauma can be dealt with. So you can live in the freedom that the Lord Jesus gives. We bring it to the light of Christ. We speak to him and we tell him. Verses 12 and 13, King David makes the distinction between hidden sins and presumptuous sins. Firstly, King David knew that he couldn't be sure of all his sins before God. Jeremiah tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We can all relate to that. And some effects of how we deal with the cause may be unhealthy. And this could lead to a stronghold that we need to be delivered from. And how does that happen? The Bible says, He who calls on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. It's Jesus Christ that we call to be delivered. We go to him who is the deliverer. You may need cleansing from things that are covered or concealed. Well, there is cleansing and healing available at the cross. You have to appropriate the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus and his blood to you. You receive his healing that he gives in faith. And you turn it all to him. You confess it all to him who knows all your thoughts. Sometimes things happen or are said and you find yourself in circumstances where you're made to feel utterly worthless or useless. You feel empty and ashamed. And that sometimes leads us to do things we wouldn't normally do and ignore the advice of our parents or our elders and we get involved in things that we shouldn't. Sometimes we reach a level where we're even shocked and think, how on earth did I get here? No one loves me. I feel utterly worthless and rejected and dejected. Is that you, I wonder? Well, if it is, the Bible says that you are not worthless. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. God chose you to be alive. He brought you forth with the intention to serve him through Jesus Christ, the Savior. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you become a new creation in him. The old person dominates no more. Behold, God makes all things new. The truth is that God loves you. He created you for a purpose. He wanted you to be born. The sin and shame you've been dealing with have been dealt with through his son, Jesus Christ. He was put to death on the cross to pay the penalty of all sin and wrongdoing. Wrongdoing even to you. So you could be free and have a relationship with the Father. There is hope at the cross for you and I. Presumptuous sins are willful or deliberate sins. These are things you know that are wrong, but you find yourself doing them anyway. All along, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, saying, No, don't do it. Don't say it. Any hidden sin, whether hidden or open, 
is designed to drive us to God's throne of grace, where we throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus and ask him to have mercy on us. King David cries out, Lord, cleanse me from my secret faults, even though I know that they're not secret to you. And you can pray that same prayer. Throw yourself at the feet of Jesus and ask him to cleanse you. Well, you may think, well, what if he doesn't accept me? What, what I have, I've hidden something really serious. The words of the Lord Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. If you come to the Lord Jesus in faith on the basis of his death, his burial, his resurrection, not trusting in your own deeds, but simply coming as a little child would come to his father and says, Father, help me. The Lord says, you will never be cast out. If you feel sinful and you think, well, I may have even committed the unpardonable sin. The Lord Jesus says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. There is hope. There is a place for you at the cross to find forgiveness, peace, and reconciliation with God. See, sin has a progression. It starts as a thought. You think about it a lot. You secretly wish it would happen. Then it does. Then it gets repeated, and then you are ensnared. Practically, there can be some relief through common sense. If there are things that cause you temptation, then remove them. Get rid of them. Walk in a different way to where the temptation is. If it's an evil thought that continually comes to your mind, the Bible says that we are to take those thoughts captive and bring them to the obedience of Christ. We do it immediately as the evil thought springs up and bring it to the cross of Christ. It takes discipline and desire to change. Remember, throughout the temptation, God gives a way of escape. God is faithful, who will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able. But with the temptation, we'll also make the way of escape that we may be able to bear it. There is freedom available over both hidden and presumptuous sins through the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, King David prays for God's power. Let the hidden faults not have dominion over me. There is victory over tormenting sins through the power of Jesus Christ. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's freedom available. There is hope available. God calls us to a life of holiness, but he gives us the power to live that life through the Holy Spirit and through his word. If you are in sin or you're dealing with something hidden, then know that there is hope for you in Jesus Christ. So please do not give up. We must seek to be led of the Holy Spirit and live lives that are honoring to the Lord Jesus. And if you think, well, I'm not living like that, but I want to, then praise God, because the Lord Jesus came to save the sinner. He says, I've not come for the healthy, but for the sick. The effects of secret faults and sin make us unfit to commune with God, even if the cause isn't our fault. So how then can we be cleansed? Here's the answer. If we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We walk in the light of Jesus Christ. If your heart is hardened and resentment has formed from someone who has said or done something to you, then take action. If there's sins that you've committed, then repent of that sin and throw yourself at God's mercy. Have fellowship with one another is, is, is an important line in that scripture. It means we have to forgive those who have hurt us, that have caused us pain. We go to the cross and give them to Jesus. Here, Lord, have them, we say. I forgive them. You ask God for help in doing this because these people could have been the ones that caused our effects. And if they did, forgive them anyway. 
Some of us may want vengeance on that person, to want to see God's judgment pronounced on them. The Bible says, repay no one evil for evil. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. In fact, the Bible says, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome by evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that is part of the way to find freedom from hidden sins, for what was done to you or how you were made to feel. We forgive them and hand them over to God. Bring those feelings and memories to the Lord Jesus and leave them with him. In doing so, you start walking in the steps towards the direction of true freedom. We are to expose unfruitful works of darkness. Whatever is hidden in the darkness can only be revealed when the light shines upon it. The Bible says to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them through bringing these hidden sins into the light of Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, through confessing the sin as it is, it is, it is brought to you by the Holy Spirit, through forgiving those who caused you to feel bad, through reading the word of God, through allowing the Holy Spirit to convict you so you ask for God's help. That is how you bring the hidden sin into the light. Pray to God to bring someone to mind that you can tell, not just anyone, but someone you can trust, someone who you know will support you. Talk to them. James says, therefore confess your sins to another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. This may help you. The ARC, the ARC. And if you remember the A of the ARC, acknowledge that something's not right and admit that there is something that you're dealing with. R is recognize the cause. You don't have to delve too deeply into it, but recognize. And if there are negative effects of that, such as a hardened heart or unforgiveness or any other sin, any hidden sin, repent of that sin. If your hidden sins involve the occult or you're dealing with any demonic things, then remember, those things must be renounced at the cross of Christ. And then C is the key. You come to the cross of Christ and confess to him. You tell it all to him to help you to find freedom. Well, you may think, there's no hope for me. I've been dealing with these hidden sins for a long time. Yes, there is hope. Jesus Christ dealt with all sin on the cross. Hidden sin, presumptuous sin, resentment sin, spoken sin, bullying sin, neglectful sin, sexual sin. All sins. There is freedom available at the cross of Christ. You were created by God to live under his blessing and protection. God says, I know the plan I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. Now God said this to the Jewish people who were in exile in Babylon. God promised to bring Israel back. And he gave them a hope and a future. And God gives this same hope to us through the cross. That's the key. That's the key. And verse 13, we shall then be blameless and innocent. And that's what we want. We want that freedom. We think about the first man, Adam, who was created blameless, sinless. And God gave him dominion over the garden. God gave him a suitable helper in Eve. And they both lived in constant communication and fellowship with God. But Satan Through the serpent deceived them. And they sinned. And they hid from God. Then they heard the sound of God walking in the garden. And Adam and Eve knew 
that when they heard God coming, he would want to be with them. And that's the way God treats us. He wants to fellowship and be with us. And if we are in sin, we come to him without hiding. When Adam and Eve sinned, they made clothing for themselves and hid their bodies from each other. They'd never done that before. When they heard the voice of the Lord God, they hid from him. And then God asked a question. He said, where art thou? Where are you? God didn't shout at them or bully them or destroy them. No, this was the question of a loving father who knows what his children have done. He asked the question to Adam to enable him to confess his sin, to return to his loving father who would forgive and make atonement for him. For some of you, God is calling to you. Where art thou? Where are you? No need to conceal yourself from God. Come out of the bushes and talk to him. Atonement has been made for you and any sin through the sacrifice of Jesus. And you approach God in faith on the basis of that atonement and not on anything else. When we sin and our consciences are pricked, let's not hide from God's holiness, but rather go to him. The Bible warns us against sin, but it says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. There is an advocate. The sacrifice has been paid. If you're thinking, well, I'm not ready to bring things out into the light, then hide in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the rock of ages. We make him our hiding place. Talk to him there. He is our refuge. He will not cast you out. There is freedom in Jesus Christ. Come to him, the light of the world, and at the right time, expose the hidden works into his glorious light. There's no need to hide anymore. The light of the world, Jesus Christ, is there to give you freedom. We'll finish with the, with, the, uh, with the words of the hymn. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, through the Lord Jesus, we thank you that cleansing is available. The atonement has been made. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for protecting and being with people, dealing with hidden faults or hidden things. Thank you that cleansing is available. Freedom is available through you, Lord Jesus. You yourself said, whoever the sun sets free is free indeed. Help us to abide in your word. Help us to abide in you. We pray for those who are not ready to bring out these things into the light. May they hide themselves in the rock of ages, Jesus Christ, and talk to you. Thank you, Lord God, as you bring to mind certain people that people can talk to confidentially, privately, in love. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for comforting us through your word. And your word says that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you for the blood which cleanses, the blood that has power over the devil and any stronghold Whoever the sun sets free is free indeed. Set us free, Lord Jesus, so we can live lives of blessing to glorify you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Thank you, Savior. We bless you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Wickford. Um, why not read uh, all of Psalm 19 today?
And if you're in a family, why don't, why don't you read it as a family? Thank you very much.